Well, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, very special convocation um, as we get to hear from one of our own dear friends and fellow residents, Ron White, on his newest book. Dean Thompson will be introducing Ron in just a moment. Uh, as always, we'll uh, listen to a bit of scripture be read. Ron's chosen Romans chapter 8, verses 24 to 28, and then I'll pray and then we'll sing. In preparation for that song, if you would turn to um, hymn number 687, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, that's the uh, hymn that we're going to sing. And what we're going to hear from Ron today is about a man named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who grew up in uh, First Parish in Brewer, Maine. And he would have sung this song, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, the English hymn written by Isaac Watts. This hymn was in Chamberlain's own hymn book, The Hymns and Spiritual Songs. And again, we'll, we'll sing uh, number 687. So listen now to the scriptures from Romans chapter 8, verses 24 to 28. In hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know this, that in all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Let us pray. These words from Paul's letter to the Romans were true when Paul wrote them, and they are just as true today. That how often we do not know what to pray, but our hearts long to pray. For concerns and cares for people that we deeply love, for our community, for our churches, for our nation, for our world, so filled with trouble. And so, Lord, we offer up this hour to you as a prayer, a prayer that we will listen well to the story of a remarkable man and receive wisdom and guidance and have an infusion of courage and compassion because of what we will learn about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. We give you thanks for Ron and for all the work that he's done to bring this story to light. We give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's sing together this song that Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain would have, would have sung 687. Oh God, our help in ages past.
It is a dear personal privilege to introduce to our local, regional, and national audiences the preeminent historian biographer, Ron White, who will speak today on his latest book. Ronald C. White's new biography on Great Fields, The Life and Unlikely Heroism of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, is a USA Today national bestseller. Ron is the author of two New York Times best-selling presidential biographies, A. Lincoln, A Biography, and American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses S. Grant. He has also written Lincoln's greatest speech, the second inaugural, a New York Times notable book, The Eloquent President, a portrait of Lincoln through his words, a Los Angeles Times bestseller, and Lincoln in private, what his most personal reflections tell us about our greatest president, recipient of the Berendus Lincoln Award. White is a graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary, receiving, receiving a PhD from Princeton University. He has taught at UCLA, Whitworth University, Colorado College, and Princeton Seminary. He has lectured on Lincoln at the White House and in England, France, Germany, Italy, Mexico, and New Zealand. He lives with his precious wife, Cynthia, here in Pasadena's Monta Vista Grove Homes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron White. Thank you, Dean, for your friendship. I want to thank so many here this afternoon who have been so encouraging over the last six years in working on this biography. A special thanks and award goes to my wife, Cynthia. She has to tolerate someone who arrives each noon more in tune with 1864 than 2024. And if I can really single out Nancy Mackey, Dr. Nancy Mackey, who has worked with me on the last three books, American Ulysses, Lincoln in Private, and now Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Nancy, professor of English and drama at Westminster College, has been a tremendous partner in all of these efforts. As I prepared the final manuscript about nine months ago, I got a telephone call from Brunswick, Maine. The person on the other end identified herself as Nina Maurer. She had been hired as a consultant to rethink the script that people would use to be touring, tour guides of the remarkable Chamberlain House. In the middle of the 19th century, Chamberlain moved his home four blocks so that it would face the college and the church and then took the ground floor and raised it 11 feet to make it the second floor and built a beautiful first floor. So at the end of the conversation, after she asked me all these questions, I said to her, well, well who comes to the Chamberlain house? And she said, well, about 60% of the people are Chamberlain fans. The other 40% are people who've been wrangled in by their friends and relatives. So I don't know where you are, whether you're part of the 60% or the 40%. After writing biographies of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant, why Chamberlain? Who is Chamberlain? On the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, leader of the 20th Maine Regiment, found himself in a back and forth battle. 
He had been given a command to defend the entire left line of the Union Army on that critical day. He stood five feet, ten and a half inches tall, strong, lean build. He talked, boasted about his ferocious mustache. And with his twinkling eyes, he had won the trust of his men. But now they were attacked coming up that craggy hill by the 15th Alabama, larger in size. And as his men ran low of ammunition, some out of ammunition, he offered just one word, bayonet. And they charged down the hill and defeated that force. And for the rest of his life, he became the hero of Little Round Top. Yet I spoke of this as an unlikely story. Why? He was a mild-mannered professor at this far-off college called Bowdoin College in Maine. He was a man of deep Christian faith and intellectual curiosity. He was fluent in nine languages. Let me say that one more time. He was fluent in nine languages. His lectures were interspersed with citations from the Bible, with allusions to Greece and Rome, with quotations from Dante and Goethe. No one would have predicted that this professor would have become this courageous hero at Little Round Top. Chamberlain was born only 50 years after the founding of our nation. For him, the union, the union was the great reality of his life. It's very hard for us today to get an understanding of what it must have meant to believe in the union. For Chamberlain, it was not simply a political reality, it was a religious reality. It was a transcendent reality. He was willing to give everything he had for the sake of the Union. The men who opposed him that day, part of the wonderful art of biography is try to get into the other side of the story, is William Calvin Oates. Very unlike Chamberlain, his parents were not deeply religious. They did not encourage education. And after three years of sowing his wild oats, traveling as far west as Texas, he went back to find the Christian faith, earn an education, and become the leader of the 15th Alabama, and after the war, a member of the United States Congress. These were the two foes. And here's the photograph of this craggy hill, little round top, the day after. I spoke at Gettysburg in November. Little Round Top, because of Chamberlain, is so besieged by visitors that Gettysburg is undergoing a $10 million two-year restoration, trying to preserve it for the future, trying to preserve all the people who come, all the signage that needs to be there. It's just an amazing place. But like many people, some in American history, the great Chamberlain story fell out of fashion in the early 20th century. His name was forgotten. There were guidebooks written about Gettysburg in the 1930s and 1940s, and Chamberlain's name was not even mentioned. And then the great trifecta took place. Some of you have, I'm sure, been a part of all of these. The first was the novel Killer Angels, which brought Chamberlain into focus. And next was Ken Burns' Civil War documentary. And then Ed Daniel Ed, uh, Ed played his role. Uh, Jeff Daniels portrayed Chamberlain in the movie Gettysburg. At one point in time, Jeff Daniels said that was the greatest role he ever portrayed, to be Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. But if the story of Chamberlain has been rediscovered, I think it's been mostly what I would call a focus on a a, a, a zoom lens, only the Civil War, only Little Roundup. What I've attempted to do in writing this biography is to give what I would call a wide angle lens, to tell the full story. I would argue that Chamberlain, more than any other person, more than Ulysses S. Grant, had more different roles after the Civil War than any other person. College professor, governor of Maine, president of Bowdoin College, writer, an amazing speaker. So let's try to enter into who is this person. But first, I need to tell you some of the convictions that kind of energize me as I'm writing biographies. The first is, 
I want to tell a story about the young person's life. Think of your own lives. You may be 60, 80, 90 here today, but when you were 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, weren't those the years that the values that are so important to you now were formed? I thought about this in recent years. Perhaps it was because I was a youth minister. I was a college chaplain. And I had the privilege of seeing this formation in the lives of young people. Last week, Cynthia and I had the privilege of being in Spokane, and I spoke to students at Whitworth University, and I saw again the wonderful power in their lives and who they are and who they are becoming. Ulysses S. Grant once said, the reason I don't read biographies is because they do not tell us the story of the young person who will become the adult. A second conviction in my writing of biographies is I want to tell the faith story. I think the faith story has really been overwhelmed, overlooked really, in modern biographies. For Abraham Lincoln, it's a Presbyterian story. For Ulysses S. Grant, it's a Methodist story. For Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, it's a congregational story. Today, we think of the United Church of Christ. It was the Congregationalists who were the founders of this country. His family were really kind of 19th century Puritans. Now, Puritanism has suffered a bad rap in recent years. A bunch of craggy people. I would like to redeem them a bit by saying, no, Puritans were people who believed in the life of the mind. And Chamberlain grew up with a mother and a father who believed in the life of the mind. Not novels, but a life of the mind. And that's who he became. Then there's often what I call pieces of the puzzle. When I approach a biography, I don't want to approach it by saying, I know the end result before I begin. I want to see what are the puzzles of this biography and then see if I can try to answer them. The first piece of the puzzle is how is it possible that this person who was so respectful of his own college education, when he became professor, challenged both the curriculum and the teaching methods of Bowdoin College? Second piece of the puzzle is how is it possible that this mild-mannered professor would become this risk-taking soldier in the Civil War? And the third piece of the puzzle, which I found most fascinating of all, is Frances Caroline Adams, Fanny, the young woman he met and the young woman he married. Who was she? When Cynthia and I were in Princeton on a book tour, my former professor at Princeton University, Jim McPherson, said, you've really written a biography of a marriage. She and he, and what was that marriage? How did it come together? Well, let's go north to Brewer, Maine, and meet this eight, nine, ten-year-old boy who is plodding across the field with his father on a summer day, helping to farm the land. Clear the wheel, his father called as the boy went forward, because you see the wheels of this cart had been stuck between two tree tumps. And the boy called out, how am I going to do it? And the father yelled back, do it, that's how. And the son gripped that wheel, those wheels, and with his young might pushed forward, and the cart was dislodged from the trees. Chamberlain said those words became what he called an order for life. Do it. That's how. He never forgot them. He said them over and over and over again. What his father told him became the way he decided he would live. He grew up in the tiny town of Brewer, Maine, a thousand people. His family was deeply religious. Many of you this afternoon will understand the method of nurture that was important for him. Most of the audiences to whom I have been speaking, this is a whole brand new phenomenon. We call it catechesis. He memorized the Westminster Shorter Catechism. 107 questions and answers. Some of us did that in seminary to try to earn the $500 of the Robinson Prize. At Princeton, my, some of my friends said, well, I'll memorize the odd and you memorize the even and we hope to hope that we'll get the right question and get the $500. <clears throat> question one, what is the chief end of man? 
Answer one, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He was committed to memory. I'm really worried about the loss of memorization. It was so thrilling a few weeks ago to meet a father who told me that his six-year-old son had just memorized the Gettysburg Address. Now our grandchildren would say to you and me, well, I can look it up on Google. Why should I memorize it? But Chamberlain understood what memorization was. It wasn't simply an act of the mind, it was an act of the heart. And he was a memorizer of the Bible, of poetry. He joined the church at age 16. He did not have some sudden conversion experience. He called himself not a sudden saint. It was a process of nurture. He was proud of that day. At age 19, he went off to Bowdoin College. Bowdoin College was established in 1808 in Maine. It was actually then part of Massachusetts. Maine became a state in 1820. Why? Because it was a five-day ride by horseback from Maine to Harvard, and Maine needed its own college. There he was immersed in a classical curriculum. Here he is as the student at Bowdoin College. Why the classical curriculum? This was the curriculum that energized colleges almost to the end of the 19th century. It's what I call a character-based education. It isn't simply the subject, it's the values. I was privileged to find Chamberlain's penmanship book. It wasn't the Palmer method that you and I learned. It was the Spencerian method, very oval-shaped handwriting, line after line after line after line he practiced. And almost like the blue books that you may remember, at the top it said, be virtuous and you will be happy. Be virtuous and you will be happy. Virtue was the great goal. The great Jonathan Edwards said, virtue is a beauty of the mind. But Chamberlain came to Bowdoin College with a deep disability. He was a stammerer or a stutterer. When he came to the letters B, P, and T, he stumbled and stopped. And remember, education in the 19th century was basically oral education. I often ask, this is an extra credit question, what is declamation? The first grammar book that Abraham Lincoln read, half of it was declamation, that means public speaking, the Bible, Shakespeare, Lord Byron. So it struck holy terror into Chamberlain that he would have to recite he was the stammerer. This is part of the unlikeliness because, of course, ultimately he became professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College. What a remarkable story. While there he had an amazing, surprising experience In his third year, Professor Calvin Stowe arrived at the college to teach religion. Calvin Stowe's wife was Harriet Beecher Stowe. And one morning in First Parish, she had literally what she would call a vision. And she knew she had to write a story. When she was the daughter of Lyman Beecher in Cincinnati, Ohio, she had interviewed many of the slaves, enslaved persons, escaping from Kentucky across the Ohio River into the north, maybe even into Canada. So she set out to write what became Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, at first, she didn't know it would become a book. It was first serialized in a magazine, and she invited students to come into her home on Saturday evening to listen to her read what became Uncle Tom's Cabin. I don't want to overemphasize what this meant for Chamberlain, but he writes about it. I'm sure this was the first time living in far off Maine that he'd ever really encountered the awful terror of slavery. He listened to Harriet Beecher Stowe. It was at First Parish, this marvelous church, the spire blew off in the wind by the end of the 19th century that he met Fanny, Frances Caroline Adams. She was three years older than him, which deeply worried her. Most marriages in the 19th century, the man was six years older than the woman. Her story is quite remarkable. It's a 19th century story that will strike us as very strange. 
She was born into a family in Boston where she was the seventh child. Her father was 50 years old, old enough to be her grandfather. And so father and mother decided that they would give Fanny at age four to his younger cousin, the pastor of First Parish in Brunswick. So she went at age four to have a new father and mother. Well, she was very talented. Uh, She played the organ in the church. But what I wanted to discover was who was this young woman? And late in my research, I found this wonderful story of Fanny. She was a 17-year-old student at Brunswick High School, and Mr. Alfred Pike asked his students to compose a paper used ending in, with verbs ending in F-Y. Now, Fanny knew that Mr. Pike did not entirely approve of her humor, so this is what she wrote. This is to certify, notify, exemplify, testify, and signify my obedient disposition. And I hope that it will gratify, satisfy, beautify, and edify my teacher. And pacify, modify, and nullify his feelings of dissatisfaction toward me. Please do not exclaim, oh fie, when reading this paper. Young Fanny was smart, and she knew it. But if you look carefully at this photograph... I think you may also see a young woman who has her own troubles. Her father, the pastor of the church, George Adams, fortunately for us, kept a very, very complete diary. But often he would write, poor Fanny, poor Fanny. Because as talented as she was in both art and music, she struggled with depression. And she struggled with something in her eyes so that by the time she was an older woman, she would go blind in both eyes. She was playing the organ, and Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was conducting the choir, but pretty soon he wasn't looking at the choir, he was looking at the organist. And they were married in 1855. When he finished Bowdoin College, the question before him was, what should he do now? And his parents were quite divided. The father wanted him to go to West Point, There was a great lineage in the family of men who had served in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. His mother wanted him to be a minister or a missionary. So he decided to go to Bangor Theological Seminary. Don't know if you remember or know that up until the early 19th century, there were no seminaries. Just like law schools, a person would go to Yale or Harvard and then they would live in or near a minister who would teach them the arts of ministry. One taught 97 such persons. Another taught 79 such persons. But then seminaries began, and Bangor was one of the first, 1814. And so he went to Bangor Theological Seminary. And here he encountered Enoch Pond, professor of theology. I, can never, I will never forget the day when I went, aha! Aha! when I found Chamberlain's 123 pages of notes of Enoch Pond's class in theology. Well, I have to make a guess here, but why did he save it his entire life? I think he saved it his entire life because it was so important. The being and nature of God, the scriptures, the person of Christ, the human mind, natural and moral ability, Nature of holiness. When he graduated three years later, he had invitations to two churches, but then he received an invitation from Bowdoin College that if he would speak at commencement, they would give him a Master of Arts degree. Evidently, his speech was so incredible that the next morning they offered him a teaching position. Now, people in this audience will understand what I'm about to say. I know, and you know, all kinds of people who've gone to theological seminary who do not become ordained ministers, but for whom that theological education is very important in their formation. Obviously, earlier biographies didn't understand that because before I wrote, Bangor Theological Seminary received as much as two sentences. Two sentences. Aha! I wanted to find out what took place for Chamberlain at Bangor Theological Seminary. Problem. 
the seminary went out of business in 2013. Fortunately for me, when I arrived in one of my summer visits in Maine, the Maine Historical Society had just taken its records and cataloged them, and I was able to understand what took place. I think those three years were very, very important. He would ultimately become executive vice president of the American Bible Society, all sorts of things he did in his Christian faith. He never became an ordained minister, but those three years were important. After graduating from Bangor Seminary and accepting this position, he now becomes professor. You can see the dress is a little bit different than when he was the student. At that time, the professors often treated the students, all male students, as boys rather than men. And he believed this had to change. He wanted to awaken the interest in his students in what you and I might call critical thinking was what he wanted to instill in his students. He wrote this, I want to awaken an enthusiasm in my pupils and keep my own style free and my mind fresh and whole. Often he was at odds with the senior faculty who had been his teachers in his attempt to redo the curriculum and the teaching method. Well, the Civil War broke out in April of 18, 19, 1861, firing at Fort Sumter, because the college had no electives, he would have known every single student who enlisted in the Union Army. You have to have a lot of help. I'm really worried today that people think they can write biography or write history sitting in their office in their college or university and work on their computer. You got to go there. I went there. And John Cross, the alumni secretary of Bowdoin College, whose father was the alumni secretary of Bowdoin College, has tracked every single graduate who served in the Union Army. And so Chamberlain was in correspondence. Men were enlisting, captured, killed. And then in 1862, Abraham Lincoln offers a proclamation saying, we need 300,000 more men to enlist in the Union Army. Within 12 days, Chamberlain wrote to the governor of Maine to enlist. Now, governors were looking for what, were called, what you might call eminent people. Sometimes they were called political military officers. People who had the ability to enlist and enroll and recruit a thousand-man regiment. The governor knew that Chamberlain was that kind of a person. In his letter to the governor, Chamberlain wrote these words, I fear this war, so costly in blood and treasure, will not cease until men of the North are willing to leave good positions and sacrifice their dearest personal interests. Duty, a masculine virtue of the 19th century, called him again. No one would have complained if he, married with two young children, had not signed up, but he decided to do so. Well, the governor offered him a colonelcy, the leadership of, the, of a regiment, and Chamberlain, I'm sure to the governor's surprise, said, no, 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 I, I don't qualify for that. I don't have any training. And this is what he wrote back to the gov governor. I will take the subordinate position and learn and earn my way to the command. This says so much about him. I will take the subordinate position and learn and earn my way to the command. Well, 10 months after Gettysburg, <clears throat> as the Union Army was descending upon Petersburg, Chamberlain was leading his men forward when he was struck by a canonical mini ball in his left hip. It went through his body, severed his blood vessels, scraped his bladder and his urethra, and stuck in his right hip. Two surgeons came upon him and told him he would die. A modern, modern physicians would say he had a 10% chance of recovery at that moment. So at that particular time, he wrote this amazing letter to Fanny. My darling wife, I am lying mortally wounded, the doctors think, but my mind and heart are at peace. Jesus Christ is my all-sufficient Savior. I go to him. God bless and comfort you, precious one. You have been a precious wife to me. To know and love you makes life and death beautiful. Cherish the darlings and give my love to all the dear ones. Do not grieve too much for me. 
We shall all soon meet. Live for the children. I'm just overwhelmed. A person able to write such a letter as he's telling the doctors, don't attend to me, I'm dying. Help the other fellows who have a chance to live. Well, fortunately, his younger brother, Tom, also of the 20th Maine, went over to that regiment, found two other surgeons who came and removed the bullet. And in an amazing way, he lived. But he went through three surgeries in future years, none of them successful. One doctor, when he was 45 or 50, said, you're not going to live very many more years with the moons that you have. When I spoke in Brunswick uh, in November, we visited the Chamberlain House and saw he couldn't even sit erect in a chair. As president, he really had to lie on a couch to be able to do his duties because the infections just came again and again and again to his body, but he never complained. One of his regiment men saw him 25 years later and said, I didn't know that you had this incredible wound because he never complained. In the Civil War, amputations were very obvious, legs and arms, but this is what modern scholars call invisible wounds. You could not see them, but there they were. Well, 10 months later, Chamberlain was back in the Civil War. His mother said, have you not given enough of yourself? He said, I've signed up for three years. He couldn't even mount a horse, but he went back. And in a remarkable set of circumstances, somehow, we don't have the written order. This is part of the prickly part of this biography. Well, we don't have a written order. Chamberlain is given the command to receive the surrender of the Confederate Army at Appomattox. Again, my professor, Jim McPherson, our greatest Civil War historian at Princeton University, says, well, everything wasn't written down in the last several days of the war. Things were moving so quickly. So Chamberlain is asked to receive the surrender. There is what my editor calls an authorial voice. I don't want to go beyond the facts, but on the other hand, I'm asked to sort of say, well, what do I think really happened? I think Chamberlain was very much aware of the armistice that Grant had offered to Lee, this magnificent peace treaty that overwhelmed Lee. The men can keep their horses. They can go back to their farms. That's what I want them to do. So now the Confederate Army came forward. It was led by John B. Gordon, like Chamberlain, a man with no military experience who had risen to the top of Lee's command. His men called him the gallant. And as he came forward, trying to imagine what it must have been like after four years of war, these men came forward. And as they approached, now three, four yards apart, on horseback, suddenly Chamberlain switches from a carrying salute to what's called a marching salute, and he saluted the Confederate soldiers to the consternation of some of his own men. What was he saluting? He was not saluting the Confederacy. He was not saluting their cause. He was saluting the courage of their men. And 30 years later, one evening, when John Bound Gordon, who had become a great leader in the South, was speaking in Brooklyn, New York. The New York Times recorded the event. He'd asked these Union soldiers to sit on the chairs behind him, and as he got to this climactic moment in, at Appomattox, he suddenly turned and said, and here is the man who offered us this respect 30 years ago. These two men respected each other. Well, the war ends. I discovered and that those who fought in the Civil War and those of us who have known people who fought in World War II, this is often the high point of a person's life. I think even I feel for the men who fought in Vietnam, what do you do after that? You're 22, 24, 25 years of age, but nothing else seems to measure up to that. So Chamberlain returns to Bowdoin College Pardon me to anybody who's been a college professor, but he found this very, very dull. But suddenly the Republicans in Maine found the hero of Maine to be the person who could, hero of Little Round Top, to be the one they wanted to run for governor. Well, the governorship in Maine was a very strange animal. It was a one-year term. So I figured out that the average term was one and a half years. Chamberlain was elected once, twice, three times, four times. Well, there was no civil rights 
reconstruction going on. But what Chamberlain said in his inaugural address as governor of Maine, there must also be an industrial and financial as well as political reconstruction. And in a very different Republican party of the 19th century, it was the party of an active government. The Democrats were the party of states' rights. And so this active Republican governor said, we must now use the government to give loans to the railroads that will now open up the whole state of Maine. He served his four years. Then after that, he was invited to become the president of Bowdoin College. Now he, he loved his college, but he wondered, I think, about accepting this position. You know that most of the colleges in the 19th century were founded by Protestant denominations, but in the last third of the century, after the Civil War, many of them found that they were not economically viable in a changing dramatic and changing national landscape. So in accepting the position, he believed something was wrong. In his inaugural address, he said, the times had shot past the college. Left out of current sympathy, she stood still, while the world at full flood flushed with new life swept on. He told his audience the college had touched bottom. He asked the question, how to rise again? He said, well, there's two answers. One could be we could confine our efforts chiefly to holding our own, strengthening the things that remain, and feel our way by cautious and imperceptible degrees. The second, we might accept the challenge of our times. He concluded, should the college conquer or should it die? Now, alumni always want to have change, but they're not quite sure what change they want. <laughs> Well, what, Bo, what Chamberlain believed was the great intellectual current of the last third of the 19th century was science. And he wanted to establish a science department. But people of religion felt and worried that science was somehow going to be a problem for their Christian faith. So right away he met headwinds. After two years, he resigned. But the ch trustees and overseers refused to accept his resignation. Three years later, he resigned again. <laughs> They refused to accept it again. So he had this great struggle going on to have this sort of really important science in the center of it. At his memorial service at the end of his life, the then Bowdoin College president said, you know, what Chamberlain was all about was what today we would call progressive education. We didn't understand it then. We didn't respect it. But he's doing back there in the 1870s what we're now doing in the second decade of the 20th century. But I want to close with this story, which I think is the most remarkable story I discovered in my research and writing. As Chamberlain is sitting somewhat quietly in his presidential office, say another election goes forward to be the uh, governor of Maine. Republicans had basically held the office from the time the Republican Party was established in 1854, but now actually there was a Democrat in the office by the name of Garcelon. But in 1879, in the fall of that year, the Republicans seemingly had won a resounding victory. They'd won the governorship, they'd won the House of Representatives, and they'd won the Senate. But Maine had an interesting rule. Unless the governor had won a majority of the votes, the House had the privilege of taking the three leading candidates, there was also a greenback candidate, and deciding among the two, and the Senate would take the two and decide among the one. Well, the Republican candidate fell 840 votes short of a majority. And then what began to happen was called the great count out. You know, sometimes when you write a biography, you sort of ask yourself the question, is there anything that has any contemporary relevance? Once upon a time, we believed in the peaceful transfer of power at the national level. And we were told this had never happened before. Well, it never had happened before at the national level, but it happened in the state of Maine. And so the Secretary of State, who was a Democrat, began to count out the ballots. In one town, five representatives and a senator lost their seats because the results were not signed in an open town meeting. In another, five representatives were eliminated because the candidates' names were listed with initials not the full name. 
The voters in the Republican town of Skohegan were disqualified because the ballot was printed in two columns instead of one. In another town, two representatives were counted out because of the misspelling of their names. In Portland, they threw out 143 votes. They were all thrown out. In Lewiston, Sacco, Bath, and Rockland, all the votes were dismissed because three aldermen instead of four aldermen signed the returns. Anger spread across Maine. Here's a photograph of Chamberlain as governor of Maine and as president of Bowdoin College. And the anger is captured in this Republican headline. The conspiracy, revolution actually afoot, only awaiting the final act. Will they commit the monstrous crime? And now people started marching towards the state capitol, armed to the teeth to take over what was called Fort Garcelon, the capital of Augusta. The governor, worried about what was taking place, sent to the Bangor Armory for 20,000 rounds of ammunition, what the Port Portland press called Fort Garcelon, and then he realized someone had to step forward, and the Democratic governor called upon the Republican Chamberlain. Major General Joshua L. Chamberlain is authorized and directed to protect the public property and institutions of this state until my successor is duly qualified. Duty called once more. Chamberlain arrived in Augusta on January 5, 1880. He found the state house barricaded with heavy wooden planks. He entered and established himself in a small office. He dismissed the paramilitary force, said, send back the ammunition to Bangor. He now became the military governor of the state. In his unanticipated position, he decided to stay clear of all political decisions. He didn't have the authority to decide who was in or out of these contested votes. Everything is confusion here, he wrote Fanny. He tried to assure her, although I succeeded yesterday in getting a good many awkward things straightened out, what vexes me is that some of our own people, Republicans, do not like to have me straighten things out. And here's the scene in the Augusta State Capitol in Frank Leslie's illustrated magazine. Two days later, he wrote Fanny again, I do not dare to leave here a moment. There would most assuredly be a coup d'etat ending in violence and bloodshed. A letter by United States Congressman Thomas Reed has a wonderful capturing photo, po, 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 photograph of Chamberlain. The resplendent figure, shining like one of the sons of the morning, which has brought us this tranquil joy, is the figure of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, to whom Lee surrendered. He described Chamberlain as one who walks the State House stairs, master of the situation. But the rumors were afloat. One rumor was they would kidnap him. Another rumor was they would kill him for his role. In a January 15 letter to Fanny, he confided to her of the bitter attacks upon him, calling him a traitor. He even heard of threats to her. If you were afraid, he told her to contact Thomas Eaton, a local police officer, to have the police keep an eye on you and our house. On a particularly frantic day, the mayor of Augusta rushed in to say, men are coming to the capital. An insurgent mob is approaching. Chamberlain stepped forward, surrounded by the battle flags of the Union Army. And this is what he said. Men, you wish to kill me, I hear. Killing is no new thing to me. I've offered myself to be killed many times when I no more deserved it than I do now. Some of you, I think, have been with me in those days. You understand what you want, do you? I'm here to preserve the peace and honor of this state until the right government is seated. Whichever it may be, it's not for me to say. But it is for me to see that the laws of this state are put into effect without fraud, without force, but with calm thought and sincere purpose. I'm here for that, and I shall do it. If anybody wants to kill me for it, here I am. And with that, he opened his coat and stepped forward. Let him kill. Whew, 
witnessing the event, Nelson Dingley, a former governor, said, there was a breathless silence for a moment. Then a veteran in the crowd called out, by God, old general, the first man that dares lay a hand on you, I'll kill him on the spot. And the crowd (laughs) drifted away. In one of the chapters in my biography, I talk about why Chamberlain became the greatest orator after the Civil War. People would stand in applause when he spoke. But I think this was his greatest speech. This time he spoke very clearly about what was at effect. Indeed, the very next day he wrote to Fanny, yesterday was another round top. Yesterday was another round top. On January 16, the Maine Supreme Court offered its ruling. It declared the actions of the count out to decertify the votes unconstitutional. The court validated unanimously the election of the Republican governor, the Republican House, and the Republican Senate. The 12 days of January 1880 were over, but the letters poured in. L.T. Carlton, a lawyer in Winthrop, Maine, penned, You have too long hidden yourself away from public gaze. Let me assure you that the old-time enthusiasm for you has not abated in the least. Ella Speer, who had been with him at Petersburg in the 20th Maine, wrote, I laughed when I saw and heard the threats against you. The men who made them did not see you in the hellfire of Petersburg. Dennis Shapley, remembering his participation in the surrender at Appomattox, wrote, General Chamberlain, we were never so proud of you as now, not even when you stood upon the boundary lines and received the surrender of our vanquished brave foe. I was most taken by the words of Helen E. Killam, a leader of the women's club movement in Massachusetts. She wrote to Chamberlain, we see it possible for a man to be a statesman, a soldier, a scholar, a gentleman, and a Christian. Well, the 12 days were over. Chamberlain retired from Bowdoin College and without any pension, he had a small military pension, no pension as governor, no pension as college president, he decided he would embark on a career in business. Florida was just opening up and they were looking for northerners who had some sort of esteem as the titular head of a company And so he invested himself in businesses in Florida with an office also on Wall Street. But it didn't work out. After 10 years, he really hadn't done much at all. And so I kind of laughed when his son, Willis, wrote this letter at the end of the 19th century to his mother. I'm coming to realize better than ever what you have seen so long, that our man cannot be best at everything, And father can never even be relied to look out for himself, but always for the other fellow. I laughed. Well, as we draw to a close, we need to go back to this. This is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, what was called the grand old man of Maine, riding in a parade in Portland in the early 20th century. But this is the scene I want to conclude with. In 1889, the 20th Maine returned to Gettysburg. In 1882, they had put up monuments to both Little Round Top and Big Round Top. And at that moment, Chamberlain offered these words. Of all the words that he's ever spoken, I think these are the finest. In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate the ground for the vision place of souls and reverent men and women from afar and generations that know us not and that we know not of, heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and to dream." Well, Chamberlain had written, as a young man, be virtuous and you will be happy. But as an old man, filled with infection after infection after infection, he wrote these words. (coughs) 
be virtuous and you will be happy. Now he wrote, be virtuous and you will pass through pain and suffer evil. But at the end of the grievous passage, you will find the good. So in my conclusion of my book and this afternoon, I've come away believing even more than when I wrote it as I've listened to audiences over the last few months. This is not simply a 19th century story. This is not simply a Civil War story. It really is a story of what does it mean to be a leader? What does it mean to be a leader? What makes a leader? What background? What behavior? What beliefs? What circumstances? What outcomes? So at the end of my presentation, I turn that question over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, for that presentation. And uh, are there questions, comments, inquiries that you'd like to pursue? Barbara? Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, this was really inspiring and offers hope. And I would like to ask you a 2024 question. <laughs> um, is there anyone in our political <clears throat> grouping today that, that you would see would have the courage, um, the humility, and the faith of a Joshua Chamberlain? Well, Barbara, a few years ago, Cynthia and I attended the, uh, one of these celebrity events in Pasadena, and David McCullough was the speaker. And they asked him a question such as the question you just asked, and he kind of said, I'm an historian, <laughs> dodged it. <laughs> I commend to you an interview that's taken place in the last 24 hours with Mitt Romney. He was asked that question. I was surprised in reading his biography, Re Romney, A Reckoning, that as he became so disillusioned with his own party, he would often spend his evenings reading biography, and I was taken aback when it said, American Ulysses. This is what he was reading. So Romney, in his answer, talked about the different points of view between Bush, I mean, uh, uh, Biden and Trump. But he concluded with this. He said, I think the final issue is character. The character of a person is ultimately the character of a nation. And so he talked about character. That's the critical issue in this election. And uh, I think, watch that video. It is so wonderful what Romney says about the centrality of character, what that should be at the heart of what we're talking about today. Yeah. Other, yeah, Nancy. Ron, one of the wonderful stories that you have in this book about character is the young Chamberlain when he had his first teaching job <laughs> and there was a rebellion among the students who wouldn't even come inside. How he handled that, what he did afterward, I think is a good example of character. Would you just tell that? Okay, my co-conspirator. <clears throat> I don't know that we would accept this today, but when Chamberlain had not even entered college, but they were often looking for a kind of a teacher, I think in the month of January. So he goes over to Wakasset and is teaching this class. And the girls come in very orderly, but the boys kind of trump in and they're doing all this sort of stuff. And Chamberlain, to the surprise of it, he takes this one boy and bang, knocks him in the jaw and knocks him down and sends the boy home. So he goes to the home, and the father is very upset about this. You've done this to my son. And the more that <clears throat> Chamberlain talks to the father, the father says, I understand. But then what you're referring to is every single afternoon, Chamberlain visited that home again and again and again and again and again, and he won the confidence 
of that boy and that boy changed his behavior and came back in. And the point I wanted to make was Chamberlain wasn't simply teaching subjects, he was teaching people. And after his first class at Bowdoin, when it wasn't even sure that he would be continued as a professor, all of his students, and we have it, they wrote this amazing letter to the president commending Chamberlain that what he was offering them was not simply the subject of the class, but a way of life, really a way of salvation. And this is why they said the college must retain this young man as a professor. Tom. Ron, some years ago, uh, we visited Gettysburg, and I'll never forget because as we drove around, I couldn't speak. Yeah. I was absolutely overwhelmed by the spirits that linger. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wondering, in your travels in researching this book, the places you visited, where did you simply experience this overwhelming sense of the spirits that linger? Well, when I started out in the summer of 2017, <clears throat> I figured out I traveled 3,096 miles from Pasadena, California to Brunswick, Maine. And I had to go there because I didn't understand Maine at all. So once I was there, I found myself caught up in the people of Maine who understand who Chamberlain is. He is the senior. He is the great citizen. So I, I found myself caught up in that. Obviously, I went to Gettysburg and I spent a day there trying to understand that battle of Little Round Top. So I have to be careful about this, Tom, though. You can, I was talking with someone a week ago, and she says, you're really in love with Chamberlain, aren't you? <laughs> it's very important in writing a biography that you also see the contradictions, you see the deficiencies, you see the, the other side of a person. A person who could be very idealistic is often not necessarily a good listener to others. So I had to be sure that I was trying to do both. But yes, I, I found Chamberlain quite an amazing person. Mark? I'm, I'm interested in uh, what you said about education then and now, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that uh, education was more person to person as opposed to reading a book. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I went to Williams College, and the model of education there is uh, Mark Hopkins on one end of a log and one student at the other end of the log, and they're, co they're conversing. Right. So uh, kind of, a, to, to me, an interesting, an interesting model. Where do you see education going today? So what kind of models of education would, would you suggest? Well, on one level, I would argue maybe we've kind of given up on character education at our large universities. That's not our task. Maybe we can't even agree on the values that would be the basis of that kind of character education. I guess I am, was drawn to Whitworth this last week because I think they are offering a character-based education. You know, what are the values? Several years ago, I was offered a commencement address, <clears throat> and I started out by saying, I bet you've been asked this question many times. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Your parents are asking. Your grandparents are asking. Your friends are asking. I said, I think there's a much more important question. Who are you going to be? Who are you going to be? You're going to do seven or eight different things in your lifetime, but who are you going to be? That's the question. Now the problem is, and we may not be doing this, but when you're paying fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year tuition, this is what's driving this question: What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I, I'm worried that we're doing away with history and English and philosophy and psychology and all these disciplines. I play tennis with a guy, and his, his he said his three grandsons are all in computer science, and I said, What about history? Oh, he said history is only for people who are going to be school teachers. Nobody needs to learn history anymore. So I, I, I am a devotee of talking about this. And, and let me read you this amazing quote as to why we would have character education in the 19th century. This was a Harvard professor who was sort of asked this question of why classical education is taking place in the middle of the 19th century. He argues that we ought to become Greeks and he railed against a self-indulging age that tolerated a constant reference to self, 
Now that was said in 1850. I think he meant 2024. A constant reference to self. That's why he was arguing we ought to have a classical education in the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. Well, we want to uh, uh, continue this tradition oh, of convocation next week. Um, if you want to continue conversation with Ron, he'll be afterwards then available uh, for uh, dinner over in um, the Rendezvous Dining Hall. Let me just say a word about next week. Our convocation speaker is Anastasio Hansel. She's a fuller educated adventurer, coach, co-founder of Women of Vision. She takes groups of women, particularly from the Western world to the developing world. She's a third culture person, having grown up in the former Belgian Congo, been rescued from, from the Congo during the revolution, and continues to minister in, in the Congo and elsewhere in Africa. And she's the founder of Global Women in Leadership. So as we think about leadership, virtue, and character, we're going to stay in the same genre next week, just a very different setting. So we want to extend a, a more, warm, deep sense of appreciation to you, Ron, and to Nancy, because <laughs> none of us produce anything alone. We always do it in community. So thank you to you, Nancy, and to Ron, and for this wonderful volume that's been created on Great Fields. Can we show our appreciation, please? Thank you. Thank you.